We want you to make yourself right at home. This is not an alien place. This is the church of God. Amen. Which is the body of Christ. I've got a picture I downloaded from the web. I saw this a couple of years ago and ran it again today. This is from World War I, Battle of the Psalm. And uh, it's a very interesting thing. And I'll leave it up here on the pulpit after the service today and let you come up and look at this. Uh, pictures like this tell a story. And when you look at it, just take into, take into consideration all the implications involved. Remember, this is 1916, and uh, it's the Battle of the Somme. has a horrible, horrible butchery that took place that day. Well, now, if you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15 with me tonight, please. John, chapter 15. Have you noticed that we've been spending a good bit of time in the Gospel of John, and we're going back to it again tonight. John in Greek is Yone, and it means beloved of God. There's an Old Testament name, means the same thing. David, or David, beloved of God. In John chapter number 15 and verse number 1, he said, I'm the true vine, my father's the husbandman. All right, now let's stop right there for a moment. Father, bless this holy word. In thy name I pray, amen. There's a, you can go ahead and be seated. There's a number of different ways to approach everything in the Bible. You can approach it from a historical context, you can approach it from a doctrinal context, or you can approach it as a kind of a devotional type thing. You can, as the fact of the matter is, from Genesis to Revelation, you probably take every verse in the Bible, and in one way or another, you can have a devotion with it because it's the living Word of God. But what we have in the Gospel of John, the last Gospel written, is a directive toward the New Testament Christian. These are believers. The 15th chapter of, 1 Corinthians of, of John is written to believers. And uh, you say, well, is that important? It's very important because of the issues that are involved here. He said, I am the true vine. Look in the book of Psalm chapter number 80 with me tonight, please. And you'll understand one of the comparisons that's made here. John, I mean, Psalm chapter number 80. Verse number 8. The 80th Psalm and verse number 8. He said, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen, planted it. Thou preparest room before it, didst cast it to take deep root, did, did, didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her bows, boughs unto the sea and her branches to the river. Now, of course, this is uh, referring to Israel, okay? The vine is Israel, called up out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. We have people that had been slaves, born into slavery, lived in slavery, died in slavery, never had a sovereign nation of their own. The only thing that pulled them together and kept them together was their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And much of that was being perverted because of where they were. So God sent them a deliverer. Now look at verse number 12. Psalm 80, why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. So we have an observer saying, you brought us up out of Egypt, but look what has happened to us. Now there's a reason for that. But the Lord said in John chapter number 15, I'm the true vine. Okay. He starts this by saying, I'm the true vine. Now this means that there's a comparison going on here. When you say something like that, that means that there's, a, there's an untrue vine or, a, or an imposter, uh, imposter or whatever. But the issue is the vine. That's the context of what you're looking at. It's quite remarkable, don't you think, that the first miracle performed in the Bible, New Testament, that the Lord performed in John chapter number 2 was turning water into the fruit of the vine? Wine. The fruit of the vine. In Mark chapter number 2, verse number 22, the Lord Jesus says to them, you cannot put new wine into old bottles. Uh, the fermentation process will burst the bottles and the wine will be will leak and it won't hold it. So what the point is that we are coming with something new. This is the emphasis. New. 
Uh, it's not a new faith. It is the maturity of the old faith. It is more of a revelation of what they believed in the Old Testament. The Lord said, I didn't come to destroy the prophets or the law. I came to fulfill it. Amen. Amen. Which meant that all the Old Testament scripture inspired of God pointed toward Christ. Said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And there are they that testify of the Baptist church, right? No. What did he say? There are they that testify of me. Amen. So we have something new. Mark chapter 2. And verse number 22, John has the I am statements, seven of them. And you know that I am is taken from the book of Exodus. I am that I am. When Moses says, what name shall I give the children of Israel to tell them that you sent me? You tell them that I am hath sent you. I am that I am. He said before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I was or I will be. He said I am everlasting, the eternal everlasting existing one. Time has no effect on it. Past, present, and future, I am that I am. Another way of saying it is that I exist because I exist. I depend upon nothing, anything, anywhere at any time to exist. Contrary to that, we could not breathe one breath tonight, tonight without him. We exist because he exists. The I am's in John's. I am the bread of life. John 6, the light of the world. John 8, I am the door, he said in John 10, the good shepherd, John 10. He said, I'm the resurrection of the life, John 11. And I'm the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. Okay. But the last I am is here in John 15, where he says, I am the true vine. In plain words, after all of these other I am's have been used, he comes down to the crowning achievement of all of it. He said, I'm the true vine. Now, this is important. The first thing that Moses did was to turn water into blood, wasn't it? When he went before Pharaoh. What is the first thing the Lord Jesus Christ does? His first miracle, he tells you plainly, is to turn water into wine. Blood's red and so is wine. Notice the comparison. Moses means to be drawn forth, to draw him forth. He was drawn forth from what? The Nile River. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, and he was drawn forth up out of the water, up out of the Jordan River. There's a good comparison between the two of them. Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage, and my friend, he could lead them no further than the bondage of the law. Because the Bible says the law came by Moses and grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Moses' credentials for leading the children of Israel to doing anything with them was two tablets that were taken from the top of that mountain when he went up there. And after 40 days, he met with God. The Lord Jesus is entirely different. He doesn't lead us out of Egyptian bondage. He leads us from the bondage of this world. Because he has the authority and the ability to, to combat and confront sin in its very essence. Amen. And the essence of sin can get into a very deep thing. Think about that tonight. There's only one that can deal with your sin. You can't do it. Only Christ can deal with your sin. So the first Adam is of the earth. And the last Adam is the Lord from heaven. The first Adam, second, the first Adam is Adam. And the only thing that Adam can ever give you is what came from the earth. That's all he has. If he has any more than that, it has to come from somewhere else, right? It's got to come from above. On the other hand, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am not of this world. He came down from above and he's the Lord of life. He's the sent one. The Bible says that in 1 Corinthians 15, the first man was of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The first man brings curse upon all mankind. If you are born of that first Adam, you were born into a curse. Well, how many here tonight got here that way? That's how I got here, amen? I'm not a Martian. <laughs> I got here the same way all the rest of you did. Born, John, Romans chapter number five, death passed upon all men, and it came from Adam. But you see, the Bible says the second man is the Lord from heaven. So what's that mean? That means that the first man and all of his progeny, everyone that was born of him, born under the curse. But the Lord Jesus Christ was not born of the first Adam. He was born from above, which means that he begins a whole new race of mankind. All mankind that lives into the future will live from Christ. They won't live from the first Adam. 
So therefore, the life that I have tonight, the life that I enjoy in the flesh is the life of the resurrected Son of God. And the only reason that my body stays alive, the scripture says that the spirit of Christ that is in you shall quicken your mortal bodies. Quicken means to make alive, to keep alive. So the Holy Ghost that's in me tonight, and I know he's in there, amen, because too many things happen, too many things changed, keeps this body alive. Not so the unsaved man. He's just like the dog and the cat, biologically, essentially the same thing. He doesn't know God. He does not have the Spirit of God living in him. And when he dies, his spirit goes back to God that gave it. Because the God is the source, the absolute source of all life. There is no life apart from the Almighty. But us, we already have eternal life. Already. Because if you've got God in you, God's eternal. And if you have the Holy Ghost in you, you have God in you. So we already are enjoying eternal life. How's it going? <laughs> a lot of... <laughs> A lot of folks mope around and you think they're already dead. You ought to appreciate what you've got. The Bible should have, become, should have uh, come alive to you. You should have had a desire to pray. And at the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to get excited. Because he's, he's it. He's everything. So the Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. It's not so much that Jesus Christ gives you grace and truth. Jesus Christ is grace and truth. You see, the emphasis in the Gospel of John is not what God can do for you. It's what God has already done for you through Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done. And anything that adds to that is an abomination. When you start adding or detracting from the word from what Christ has done, you're a heretic of the first order. Amen. That's all I can say. So... That after the perfections of the person, if you'll notice in John chapter number 15, after all of these things, bread of life, light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection of the life, truth and life, and the true vine. After that, then we get into John chapter number 15. If you look at this thing, have you ever looked at it and, re and read it and ask yourself the question, well, now what was this really about? I mean, what, what's, what's, the issue? what's the theme here? What's the issue going on in John 15? Do you remember in 1 John chapter number 1 when he starts out 1 John written by the same John? What's he say? He uses a word. He says, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. That fellowship with the Father and with the Son is through and by the Holy Ghost. So there's the Trinity in unity at work in your life. Do you want fellowship with God? The Greek word koinonia is translated fellowship. All right? They share something in common. There's a lot in common with God, folks, that I've got in me tonight. Do you feel like you're a stranger in this world? We are. We're pilgrims and strangers. We have no continuing city, it says in Hebrews chapter number 11. We look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We don't look for anything on this earth permanent because it's going to melt Peter said, with fervent heat. It'll be dissolved, pass away, be gone. So he said, lay up yourself for yourself treasures in heaven. And there's a new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. And that new Jerusalem isn't finished yet. Why is it not finished? Because it's made up of the saints of God, their faith, their tears, their life, and everything about them. And then when it comes down, it comes down as the bride of Christ. Think about it now for a moment. Is the bride of Christ complete? It won't be complete until the last one is saved and then he comes and takes his bride home, right? Well, then that means that every single one that is added to the bride of Christ is also added to that new Jerusalem. The Bible says Jerusalem, which is above, is what? Free. And it is the mother of us all. So the next time you say alma mater, think about that. Do you know what that word means? Mater in, in Latin is mother. Potter in pater or mater, whichever way you want to pronounce it, is father. Alma means virgin. Virgin mother. <laughs> I swear it's quiet in here. I don't. <laughs> so that preacher's going to plumb off the deep end. <laughs> no, just go look it up. But why do they call it that? They call it that because she hath begotten you and sent you into this world with her training, her knowledge, her understanding, and all that she could ever know. This is, what, this is why they, I don't know if they still do or not, but colleges used to give what's called a liberal arts degree. Do they still do that? 
Okay. Well, what is that? Well, liberal arts means that we have educated this person to the point to where they understand the world they're in, how to deal with that world they're in, to make uh, conscious choices, and to be able to debate and have an analytical mind. The greatest thing that a college will ever teach you or anybody else is how to think. And here's a problem. They're turning them out by the truckload and they're brainwashed. They don't know how to think. They're like a computer. Turn your computer on, boot it up, type something into it. It's loaded. I mean, that computer, I tell you right now, anything you want to know, it's loaded. You see, that's the way a lot of people are to come out of, a, come out, come out of college. Didn't mean to get on this. Lord have mercy, how did I do this? <laughs> but they, they come out of college and all they are is a walking computer. That's all they are, an encyclopedia. They know a bunch of stuff, but that's all. That's all. They haven't been educated. They've been brainwashed. All right. So uh, where are we? <laughs> The I am's of John, the I am's of John prepare you for what we're going to talk about tonight because this is the important part. First John deals with the aspect of fellowship with God in sin. Remember that? In sin. All right. It says these three things about sin. First John. It says that if we say we have no sin, we what? We deceive ourselves. The Bible said if we confess our sin, he does what? Faithful and just, right? Confess our sins. Faithful and just, cleanse all rights. If we say we have not sinned, then what? We've called God a liar. So be very careful when you get into the issue of trusting your heart, which comes to repentance. Think now for a moment. How many of you in this house tonight trust your heart completely and implicitly? There's no doubt in your mind that your heart is pure and it'll never say a, it'll never lead you astray, confuse you, or deceive you. Not me. I wouldn't trust my heart for a minute. All right. But you see, here's the problem with people who repent and say that's part of salvation. Now, listen, I'm not against repentance. Not at all. But put it in its right context. They say, well, you've got to repent to be saved. Repent of what? Well, well, answer that. Which one? How many? What about later? The Bible says, when the spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself. But what he hears, that shall he speak. Right? he show you things to come. Right? When the Lord Jesus Christ sends the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will convince the world of all your sins so you can repent. What's it say? He will convince you of sin because of what? What's the one thing that the Holy Spirit is concerned about in your life because you believe not on Christ. That's what it says. That's it. Now think about that for a moment. Now, once you are saved, once you receive Christ, once you accept his salvation, once you've done that, then repentance will start rolling off your lips like you wouldn't believe. You'll do some heavy duty repenting. And it may, it may take a while to do all the repenting you need to do. I remember when I was saved, I was working a line mechanic and I was in there repenting. I did this. Lord, help me. I did that. God, forgive me for this. Lord, I did this. God, forgive me. But I'd already been saved. I, be, I was saved because I received the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be saved. Repentance doesn't save you. Repentance is a fruit of salvation. It's an evident sign that God has done a work in your heart. Amen. So, uh, you call him God a liar. Now, the, 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 the issue here in the, gospel, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, there's a word that he uses here that's very important because he uses it over and over and over again. That word is abide. Abide. Have you ever heard, uh, when I grew up, I used to hear people say he bided his time. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. All right, that's connected directly. You see, abide's an old word. Greek word is minnow. And uh, it was, with, the, with the prefixes to it, it can come across a lot of different ways. Listen to this. Uh, ana meno, to await. Uh, dia meno, to continue abiding throughout. M meno, to persevere. Uh, epi meno, to continue in, tarry. Kata meno, to remain or abide constantly or frequently. Uh, and abode, a place to stay, to remain beside, endure, wait, stay around, abide still longer, continue, hold out, remain or abide under, be patient. Now, wait a minute. 
The Bible says, except you abide, if my word abides in you, you abide in me, then you can ask what you will. Here's the point. The Gospel of John chapter number 15 is written to tell you that regardless of what comes your way in life, and folks, no man can tell you what's going to happen. Only God knows that. But whatever comes your way in life, you are to stick with Christ. Hold on to Him. Whatever amount of faith you got, take hold of Him. And by doing that, you are abiding. See the key? And by abiding, John 15, you're having fellowship. Fellowship, that's what it's about. John 15 is written for you to have fellowship. Does God want to have fellowship with His creature? You're the crowning achievement of His creation. Six day, walked with Adam the cool of the day. Didn't walk with an angel. Didn't walk with a cherubim. I don't hear him walking with a seraphim or any of that, but he walked with a man. The man. He walked with him in the cool of the day. He walked with him because he wanted to receive back from him the great gift that he put into him. Hebrews 2 said he made him a little lower than the angels. Talking about the man. A little lower. He's a little lower in might and power, not lower in creation stance with God. You know, I've gone through this before, and I'm going to go through all this again tonight. The angel is greater than you in the sense that he has power that you don't have. But it doesn't mean that he has a place in the future that you have. Man was made to enjoy God and God to enjoy the man and the man to be brought into the presence of God and, 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 and experience God and see God like nothing else has. Thank you, Lord. Man has. That's something about it, see. You get a preview of it in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15. Abide in me. My word abide in you. His word comes into your soul. You accept his word. You believe his word. This is elementary, folks. This is the very basis, the basis, the structure. You have to learn your ABCs to form words, to form sentences that give thoughts. See how it works? You learn that. You compose a paragraph, and on it goes because you're putting down your mind. And it all starts with learning A, B, C, D, E. All right. Well, this is just as simple as that. It's just as simple. Yes, it is. This is the simplicity. This is the basis and the foundation of who and what we are. We have to get this right or we never will get anything right when it comes to the Lord. The basis of that salvation, the basis of that faith is to learn two simple things. And that's this. He said, without me, ye can do nothing. He said that in John 15. In 1 John chapter number 1, he said, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. Else you're stumbling in darkness. So the choice is this. You can walk in your arrogance and your pride and your self-sufficiency your self and in your self-love. God help us. You can walk around like that in this present generation, and you're full of yourself, and you're full of pride, and you're not walking with God. There's no way in this world that you could be walking with God like that. Or you can take God at his word, the simple statement of, without me, ye can do nothing. Right. All right. So here we have two things. First John 1, you are a helpless sinner that can't do anything to better your lot. Amen. Nothing, nothing. What if I do penance? What if I crawl on my hands and knees? What if I do this? I do that. Yeah, you're doing it. But the problem is it's already been done. Therefore, you are a helpless sinner. But if you'll simply take these three things that he gives you in 1 John, take them, establish your life on them, believe them, then that's the part of fellowship about sin. In John chapter 15, if you'll accept what he says, without me, ye can do nothing. Well, then you are totally helpless. We're helpless sinners and we're helpless. Amen. So I'm going to do the work of the Lord. No, you'll do dead works. The work of the Lord can only be done by the Lord and can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's right. That's the only way. You may mean well, the, the work you've done may be, may be beneficial, it may be helpful to people, but it is not the fruit of the work of God. 
Only God can do that. But he will not do that for an arrogant, proud, know-it-all, self-sufficient uh, preacher, teacher, Sunday school teacher, Christian, whoever you are. Now note carefully, 1 John and John 15 are both written to Christians. Right. Neither one of them are really written to get you saved. They're written for you to have fellowship with the Father. In one place, fellowship as it relates to sin, and another place, fellowship as it relates to your spiritual condition before God and the sustenance and strength that you receive. I think it's a remarkable thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. When I look at it, I think to myself, you know, this is something. When you think about the Holy Spirit, and I don't know, do you have red, a red letter Bible? <laughs> look at all this. I've got every kind. I've got Bibles that don't have red lettering. But look at this. Every bit of it's red. It's all red. Red. And of course, you know, they do this because this is the Lord speaking. And uh, I've known people who wouldn't have anything but a red letter Bible. Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Whatever you do. I've got both. But the point is that it is God's word, his living word. And if you will believe what he says in his word and receive his word and not argue with him about his word, whether it makes any sense at all in your soul and in your spirit doesn't matter. You don't walk, God because, walk with God because you can figure anything out. You walk with him because you trust him. Salvation, I said Sunday night, salvation, folks, is a person. Okay? It's a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Faith in that person, trust in that person, brings you salvation. When the thief on the cross died, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You wouldn't believe some of the, some of the emails and, and stuff I've gotten from Sunday night's message. Now, Preacher Lawson, don't you understand that you've got to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins? And they'll run you to Acts 2.38. They'll run you here and run you there. And one of them said, yeah, but he died under the Old Testament law. Talking about the thief on the cross. Can anybody tonight tell me? There you go. And so what does it say in Hebrews 9? Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. So when the Lord Jesus Christ died, Hebrews chapter number 9, I think it's 17, 27, somewhere in there. He says that when he died, the Testament, the New Testament, the Hakene Diatheke was brought, was ratified. It was given validity, power, authority. It, it was brought into being the moment the Lord Jesus Christ died. Notice it says, not without the resurrection of the testator. It says the what? The death of the testator. The testament is not in force. So the testament did not start, though it pointed to that, with the Lord's Supper. When the Lord gathered his disciples together, washed their feet, they had the Lord's Supper, which is a blessed event. I'd never take anything from that. But that did not start the New Testament. The New Testament started not in Matthew, the chronological order of the Gospels as they're laid out in your Bible. It started when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. And he died. And that's when it started. And that thief, therefore, was still alive. And he died under what testament? The New Testament. Now that poses a problem, doesn't it? Remember when I said to you that uh, the Syriac Peshito shows up first, second century after Christ. First time the books of the New Testament are compiled together, brought together to create what we call a Bible. Until then... For the most part, most people, if they were even privileged to that point, might have gotten hands on uh, the original text of John or Matthew, Luke or whatever. But most of them didn't because they had no printing presses. It had to be hand copied, you see. So therefore, what? How, think about it for a moment now. You, you've heard something how Christ died for your sins, but you've never seen a piece of Scripture if you accepted Christ, would you be saved? Well, of course you would. Amen. Of course you would. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading from what? He wasn't reading from the, from the, from, from the New Testament. It didn't exist. What was he reading? Isaiah. He was 700 years old when he was reading from it. And he was reading 50, uh, 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And he said to Philip, who had been brought down to him from, from up in Samaria, uh, Philip said... 
what are you reading? He looked at it. He said, understandest thou what you read? He said, how can I? Except some man show me. And then Philip right there began to preach what? Preached Christ. Preached Christ. From where? The 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He preached Christ. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. Did you know that you can lead someone to the Lord and never open a New Testament? <laughs> he did. <laughs> and no, test, no New Testament existed, folks. It didn't exist. The fact existed, yes. But there was no book. No book. And yet that Ethiopian eunuch believed. And the Bible says when he believed, he, uh, he was born again. He was saved. And he became uh, my brother, my, sis, my brother and my sister in the Lord. Will be many, 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 many of them that we'll meet that we've never heard about. We don't know anything about them. Some of them have been gone a thousand years, some two thousand years. We don't know. But they are our brother and sister in the Lord. God did not make it hard to get saved. He did not hide the gospel of salvation behind some rock somewhere. He did not entrust it into the hands of some religious hierarchy. He made it plain and he made it simple. And I think the reason he put the thief on the cross in there is because of uh, that simple fact that it's, that it's that's there. I mean, just look at it. And, but I think it's also in there. Uh, another comment that came in was that this is a deathbed confession, and it is. He couldn't go any further, and yet he still got saved, didn't he? Right. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And so that, thanks be unto God, you can hold out hope for one of your loved ones when they come down to that moment. God's the only one that can judge the human soul and to know whether you've passed what's called, a, you know, a conscience seared with, uh, like, uh, burned with hot iron. All right. So the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John tells me that even if everything blows up around me, and it can, I mean, we've had things happen to us. We all did. I got sick 10 years ago, but God's been with me. Uh, just the other day, they were talking about in Luttrell, a house burned, four little children died in that house. Four little children died in that house. I mean, you know good and well, folks, Satan uses opportunities like that to sift you and say to you, where's your God? See, what you do, you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot serve the Lord because you figure everything out. You serve him because of his character. You know him. And that's how you abide in him. Amen. Okay. Well, that's about all I got tonight. I hope I got enough to kind of stir you up. Pray for me because I've been doing some study about righteousness. And we've got an issue going on today with righteousness. Remember what the Lord said? He said he didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but what? Did not both of them need to be saved? Of course. He's, he's, the Lord uses a play on words sometimes. Yes, he does. He, uses play, he plays on the word. He'll make you think. He has reason for that. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the time we've had together to study it. I pray I haven't butchered it too bad. I pray I've said a few things tonight that'll help folks. I pray that they take to heart what I've said, that the gospel's simple. Christ is simple to us. And we don't need a bunch of man-made complications added to it. To have Christ is to be saved. To trust in Christ is to walk in fellowship with the Lord regardless of whether it's about our sin or about our spiritual condition, regardless of whichever one it may be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, appreciate